Hi guys, welcome to the Pepper H podcast. In this episode, Lewis and I are privileged to be joined by David Bash. Now, David lives in the States, just outside Los Angeles, and is the CEO of the IPO Festival, which the Pepper has played on a few occasions in Liverpool, New York, London, and he runs this festival all around the world. So it's a really interesting story. David talks about how he set up the festival, the origins behind it, and also the podcast that he hosts called Material Issues. Now, this is a fantastic story. Enjoy. I see the way you look at me, girl. And I feel the way you move on me. David, thank you for coming on this podcast. Thank you for having us. So, uh, having me, Ryan and Lewis. That's oh, it's great. a pleasure. But uh, how, first, before we get into things, how are you finding things? Obviously, with the pandemic and everything, with what you do, it's all good to finally be, you know, promoting and getting ready to do music again. Yeah, uh, it was tough. Uh, in 2019, we didn't do one IPO show anywhere. Um, and 2020, we didn't do anything until, until September. But finally... Um, my friends uh, who uh, run the label Spider Pop Records, they're located in Arlington, Texas. They own a venue as well. And they invited me to do IPO down there in September of 2020. Um, so we did, and it, it felt great. Uh, the response was excellent. The bands were excellent. Um, it was a really good time. And then in November, we did IPO in, again in New York, in Boston, and in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. And um, those all went very well also. People, you could tell, people were really looking forward to uh, being able to go out and see bands again. And also the thing, the thing. well, here, here's what happened. Arlington is in Texas and they are, let's, let's put it this way, they're, uh, they're, not, they're not that uh, concerned about vaccinations. So nobody, no one was required to be vaccinated at that at that venue, but somehow a lot of people were anyway, and uh, some even wore masks. So as far as I know, nobody got COVID from the the festival. But then in in, in New York, uh, Boston, and Hamilton, where people were more concerned, the clubs required vaccination cards to get in, and um, it was because of that I think that. The bands were comfortable playing and people were comfortable going. Uh, so I was glad. I was glad. In fact, I advocated for it. I said, you know, if if we don't have uh, if 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 vaccinations aren't required, a lot of people aren't going to come because mm. some of the clubs thought it would be the other way around. They said, well, if we do require vaccination, you know, people, some the anti-vaxxers aren't going to come. And it's like, well, yeah, but you have to understand that the people who are vaccinated are very concerned about the anti-vaxxers. They don't want them in there. And there's a lot more vaccinated than unvaccinated. So I think, <laughs> I think we should uh, require them. So everybody did. And we felt no one had to wear the mask in inside the venue. Some people did anyway, but it went very well. Everyone was very, very comfortable. And uh, we had really good crowds and you could tell, I mean, People had been missing live music and yeah. they were so grateful to have it back. And so was I, because yeah. I was, um, I, I mean, I didn't have, I really missed IPO, but per, on a personal level, I didn't have much of a problem, you know, being, being more or less sequestered in my home. Uh, I never got COVID, thankfully, neither did you know, my wife, Rena, um, but uh you know, I, we didn't go very many places either, you know, the supermarket, maybe, and eventually some record shops and things. <laughs> how, how could I, yeah, how could I forgo that for two years, right? But you know, I'm used to working at home anyway, and I'm kind of an introvert. So, you know, it wasn't like I was really missing being around big crowds or anything. Um, you know, I, I was comfortable being at home and, uh, you know, just watching, watching, you know, streaming shows, listening to music, reading books, and because I'm an old man, taking a lot, a lot of naps. <laughs> so, so it wasn't so bad. 
but I'll tell you, once we got back to doing IPO, it was uh, it 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 was so refreshing, and it was I didn't realize how much I missed it. So this year, we um, we're going to be doing it in Chicago in uh, April, um, also Phoenix, uh, Arizona in April, and then we'll be back in Liverpool at the Cavern from May 15th through 22nd. So um, we really, you know, we can't wait for that. And then I'm working on other ones uh, later in the year. So things seem to be easing up just a bit, I think. (laughs) Um, just a question, David, obviously, like, you know, you mentioned there that with the amount of festivals and things that you've put on in so many states and cities and countries, was that the first time, like during COVID, like the first time that you've actually had time to kind of sit down and like almost have nothing to do? Because I'd imagine like logistically, if you're doing that many, you know, that many shows and that many states and things like that, you must be planning so far in advance. So what was it like to kind of just sit at home and have nothing to do like for the first time? And how long was that your first break? Like, like, you know, as I as I sort of alluded to or tried to, I, I, I wasn't bored. That was, I you know, a lot of my friends were saying, oh, you don't have anything to, you know, if they, for example, if they were off work because of COVID or whatever, it was like, yeah, I'm, I don't know what to do with myself. It's like, I never was bored. Um, I always, I always had something. So, yeah, it was fine. It, it really was. But I'm very glad to be back doing what I'm yeah. doing. On one yes. hand, you're probably glad you took a step back, but now, now you've had that break, you're like, right, I've missed it. Back, to, back yeah, to, oh, back to good old rock and roll. <laughs> I really missed it, and uh, I did. Like I said, I didn't realize how much I missed it until I was back there. And uh, you know, I thought, I thought, oh, am I, you know, have I forgotten how to do this? Am I on stage? Am I going to make a fool out of myself? But no, it felt, even though I hadn't done a, an IPO for almost two years, it felt perfectly natural. So. And you know, obviously, good. I know you mentioned there September 2020 uh, in Arlington was like your first kind of one in for, for a little while. Because um, obviously, COVID started around the March, didn't it? So obviously, September that that's almost kind of early in some regard, isn't it? Like so, uh, September 2021. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Right, I was going to say I, was... I made a mistake. <laughs> yeah, no, that's 2021. So cool. I was going to say, well, that was some amazing planning. They really didn't care about vaccinations if you could gig that early. <laughs> so, well. No, no, everything was <laughs> locked down at that point. Um, that would have been the only festival going (laughs) yeah 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 really (laughs) yeah so obviously i know obviously you have to deal with a lot of the bands and things like that you know in the lead up to that what what was the sort of atmosphere from from the bands that you were booking as well obviously in the lead up to that that first one back i mean because obviously i know we say about people you know and live music and as you know either musicians like we all are or just music lovers you know it's, it's a real big part of you isn't it whether it's performing whether it's enjoying it or going to see a band so when you sure. were talking to the bands and booking it and you know when the first band took the stage in that september what, what was it like again just being there around the bands as well you know from a performing i mean it was like two years of pent-up energy just ready to go kind of thing you could sense it it was palpable from the band's perspective they had you you knew they missed it and uh it 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 definitely reflected in their performances. Well, more enthusiasm, more, I think more gratitude from being able to do it after all that time. Um, yeah, even in Texas where, you know, they didn't take the pandemic quite as gravely as other states in the, in, in the U.S. did. Um, I, you know, the one thing I will say is there were some bands who weren't ready to play. Um, there were a few I invited, not even in Texas, but mainly in some of the other cities who, you know, just felt like uh, we're not, uh, we're not comfortable going to venues where there's a bunch of people, even if everyone's vaccinated, I, yeah, we're just not ready yet. So there were a few that uh, didn't accept my invitation for that reason. Not too many though, fortunately. Yeah. Uh, But yeah, some people weren't ready and uh, some people are still not ready. i even inviting bands to uh, play in Liverpool, there were um, there were some that said, "No, you know, we're just not ready to be in a in a venue yet. So, uh, you know, we're still worried about COVID." So it's it's still baby steps, isn't it? I mean, as a band, I mean, that's the Peppermint Apes. I mean, it took us a bit of time to to feel comfortable gigging sure. again um, because there's kind of sort of two versions of us. I mean, you know us, David, as an originals band. Uh, obviously when we play the IPO and we write songs but we also play good old covered band nights as well um, at good pubs which are good fun 
we had quite a few gigs lined up, obviously, that we had to cancel because of the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and then recently, we've you know we've started to gig again, but it, it, we were a little bit on edge. Do we do it? Do we you know do we not? I mean, Lewis, at one point, unfortunately, you had COVID, didn't you, in December? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, no, it's but, all good. Thankfully, I caught oh, the uh, the most mild variant, if you can say, oh, thankfully. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah. And, and I was already double vaccinated and triple because we got, like, they're doing yeah. booster jabs here as well now. Yeah. Yes. So, thankfully, it was, it was very mild. But And yeah. although Lewis recovered uh, and was doing fine, we had another gig at the end of January, but we just thought to be safe, we cancel and then we'll start again. So, everyone's at different levels. Yeah. Um, but no, it's great to be back it's great to be gigging again but for david obviously we'll talk more you know when we played at the ipo etc but let's go back to the beginning because it's such a good festival anyone who's tuning in for Thank the you. first time it really is a good festival and and david the, what you do for the unsigned community is second to none you really do give bands a chance and i appreciate you know, that and the, and the chance to play I mean, all over the world really you know america and london you know, Liverpool, the cabin, probably the greatest venue in the world. Um, I mean, that's that's a bold statement. I, I would agree. I mean, uh, not, that I, <laughs> not that I've been to all of them, but it's certainly the best one I've ever been to. Yeah, it's just there's something special about it. But the, the fact that you give people that opportunity, it's so entertaining and full marks to you. But how did it start? When did you, what made you, what gave you the inspiration? You know, tell us about how you decided to form the IPO Festival. All right. Well, thanks for asking, Ryan. Um, back in the 90s, I was writing reviews uh, for several um, uh, pop and power pop fanzines. They were springing up in the mid 90s um, in accord with what we like to call the power pop renaissance. Back at, uh, power pop started started happening in the 70s. Hmm. And uh, then, you know, with the new romantic stuff and, you know, the Britpop and all the other stuff in the 80s and early 90s, it, it kind of went on a bit of a hiatus. And then in the mid 90s, it started to resurrect. Uh, I think in part because there were power pop fanzines starting to happen and a lot of bands saw them and, and said, you know, this is pretty cool music, we should do it. Um, so I got to know a lot of bands from, from that, from them sending me their, their CDs. Uh, very little vinyl at that time, as you might remember. It was uh, that too had gone on a bit of a hiatus. Not as much in the U. I'll I'll tell you this: in the U.S., after 1990, there was very little vinyl until the you know the resurgence in the late 2000s. In the U.K., I know it it went on a little bit longer. Uh, and I, I'm actually uh, I'm actually always on the lookout for for. UK uh, albums from the 90s on vinyl because they're so they're so rare but anyway um so there was that and I got to know a lot of bands from all over the world um as they were releasing some really good music um concurrently there was a festival that cropped up in Los Angeles called Poptopia and uh I knew the the guy who organized it and I I went to the first one and it was just amazing. I'd never seen anything like it. Uh, mostly Los Angeles based bands, but some from other places, other places, US, and even from, you know, different parts of the world. I saw what was going on. And, you know, like I said, I really enjoyed it. And um, I had bands ask me about Poptopia and ask me, how, how can we play that festival? And I, I mean, I mean, bands from all over the world. And I said, well, let me let me talk to the organizer and see what he thinks. So I went to him and said, can we can I be involved in this? Can I funnel bands in your direction? Um, a lot of bands from outside of L.A. want to want to play Poptopia. And he said, all right, sure. So I started doing that. And as it turned out, he only had enough room for a small number of bands from outside. He knew the LA scene really, really well. In fact, he, he kind of galvanized it. He put on his own smaller events in LA, got all these pop bands together. So that's why he was able to do Poptopia. So he was very entrenched in that. But he didn't know as much about band, as much as I did from bands outside of LA. So, you know, he welcomed my help, but he just didn't have the room. 
So he had to turn down a lot of really good bands just for that reason. So I would tell, you know, I, they would come back to me and say, you know, we applied for Poptopia, but we got turned down because there wasn't enough space. And they said, you know, we're really bummed about that. And I was also, because I was looking forward to having those bands come to Los Angeles so I could see them. Uh, so I thought about it and I, I, I was having lunch with a music attorney friend of mine named Ben McLean. This was December of 1997. And we're talking about Poptopia and how bummed I was that bands couldn't come. And then I said, you know what? I'm going to do my own festival where, yes, we'll have a lot of bands from Los Angeles, but also a lot from all over the world, because I, I really I, I want to give them a platform to play. So and he and he and Ben said, yeah, you should do that. And I, I mean, I was really I had a lot of trepidations. I wasn't sure it was going to work. I um, especially with so many bands from outside of, you know, most local people you know, like to see bands they know. They don't necessarily want to see um, ones they haven't heard of. So I was worried about that. Uh, I got a lot of encouragement, though, and I got some discouragement from people. But I trudged on and um, I invited bands, these bands I had worked, whose CDs I'd reviewed from all over the world. And I was amazed at how many people took me up on my offer. Uh, granted, flying, flying was, and hotels were a lot cheaper then, but still it wasn't, it wasn't pocket change. You know, it was a lot of money to invest in, in coming over. But the lure of Los Angeles uh, during the summer that's when we did it. Uh, we did, at that time we we scheduled it for August of 1998. So the lure of that uh, was just too great for Ben to pass up, and um, so we ended up doing it for the first time in August of 1998. We had 110 bands, half of whom were from LA, half were not, and including 15 from outside the U.S. And it went really, really well. I mean. You know, we had some shows where people were lined up uh, around the block. I couldn't believe it. Uh, I was so happy. And um, we did it there. We moved it into July. It was more convenient for people. We did it in L.A. exclusively for four years. Then in 2001, I put together a panel discussion. And a bunch of bands who had traveled from wherever came to the panel and a few of them stood up and said, David, it's time you brought the festival on the road. Uh, I mean, they had been spending a lot of money to come to L.A. for four straight years. And uh, they wanted me to start doing it in their areas. So I thought, wow, OK, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready for that. Uh, but that night at, at the IPO show, a friend of mine from New York uh, named Michael Mazzarella, he had a band called The Rooks. He said, David, do it in New York. I know everybody there. I'll get you into venues. I'll find more you know, bands for you. It'll be great. And I said, okay, <laughs> let's, yeah, let's go for it. He's got some good friends. Uh, yeah. So sure enough, we were able to get venues. I think we had about four or five different venues in New York scheduled. We, um, and I had all the bands ready and it was all booked. And then September 11th happened. Um, and uh, I was, you know, I was wondering, you know, should we carry on with this? I waited about two weeks, contacted the bands and said, look, you know, I understand if you don't think it's appropriate to do this after what happened. Uh, let me know your thoughts. Everyone who responded said, no, no, we need to do it. We need it now more than ever. Um, so we did. Uh, New York was still in a bit of a shambles then, and some of the venues were still a little bit difficult to get to, but it ended up working out amazingly well. Um, and it was like, wow, this is, this is ter terrific. And then uh, the following year, we uh, brought it to Chicago. And uh, as I mentioned to you uh, off air, International Pop Overthrow was partly named after the, the debut album by a Chicago band called Material Issue. And the lead singer of Material Issue, his name was Jim Ellison. He sadly took his own life um, a, a, a few years before. 
So I wanted to pay tribute to him by naming the festival after his band's first album. So Chicago naturally was like, oh, wow, yeah, we, we want to have this. And in fact, the surviving member of, members of Material Issue had their own bands uh, at that point, and they really wanted to play and to be a part of it. So we did it in Chicago in April of 2002. That went fabulously well also. Um, so everything's going great. The following year, I get an email from a woman named Jean Cathero, and she she said I've heard she she was from Liverpool. And she said I've heard about your festival. Have you ever thought about uh, doing doing the festival overseas? And I said, well, kind of dreamed about it, but I don't know. That may be too much. And she said, well, I I live in Liverpool. I know the people at the Cavern Club. Would you like to do it there? I'm like you could have knocked me over with a feather. <laughs> I would not have dreamed about that in a billion years. So, you know, I, after I recovered from my shock, I said, yes, sure I would. And she said, well, leave it with me. I'll be back to you in a couple of days. Sure enough, two days later, she says, they want to do it. It's like, oh, my God. Wow. Yes. So we put that together. And in 2003, at that point, uh, IPO Liverpool was in October, not in May. Um, and um, yeah, we did it there and it was great. And all right, so that's that's kind of how it started. Since then, we've uh, we've added some cities, uh, we've subtracted others. Um, at our peak a few years ago, we were actually in 16 different cities. Um, and Liverpool has gone on, as has New York and Chicago every year and Los Angeles. Um, you know, now post COVID things are a little bit shakier, but I'm sure we'll, um, you know, so that, that's another thing about post COVID. Not only are the band, some of the bands still a little iffy about playing, but some of the venues didn't survive COVID. Uh, I don't know if that's the case in London, but it was, it is in a, a lot of cities throughout the U S yeah, um, they closed. They could, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't survive not being open for all. And even the cavern, and I, I can say this because they made it public. Um, I'm trying to remember when this was. I think it was at the end of 2020. They, uh, they put out a, a message on YouTube. It was a live message from the, with the owner of the cavern. And he said, you know, we need help. We haven't been open for months. We're losing money, you know, uh, you know, like like water, and uh, we've, you know, we don't know what, we don't know if we're going to be able to stay open. Um, to all of us, we're hoping like maybe uh, Sir Paul would buy it or something. You know? <laughs> yeah. it, it could just be a tax write off for him. Um, he didn't have to. Fortunately, the city of Liverpool came to their aid, um, but they're still I'm feeling they the fallout of uh, uh, of post COVID. They have been open for a while, but. You know, they're not getting the crowd in certain on certain days. They're not quite getting the crowds they used to because some people are still not comfortable going to venues, especially one like the cavern, which can get so crowded and it's downstairs, no windows, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but we've had venues in Los Angeles, in New York and anywhere you can think of who've closed and uh, aren't going to reopen. So in Los Angeles in particular, I'm having to find new venues because some of the ones we used aren't around anymore. Um, or another thing they're doing is because they have had been closed and have lost a lot of money. They're not doing live original music anymore. They're just bringing in DJs and cover acts because those draw. Uh, li live original music doesn't. So while they used to do it, now they can't afford to anymore. So I have that to deal with in certain cases. So it, it's a challenge, you know, and it's a challenge for everybody, not just not just me and IPO, but it's a challenge for bands. It's a challenge for venues. It's, um, you know, we're slowly picking up the pieces and some people haven't survived it. And, um, you know, we all we can hope is that some new venues start opening up once once uh, everything is back to normal and uh, all will be good. No, I completely agree, David. It's uh, it's good to see live music again. And, and like you said, you know, DJs kind of pulling the crowd now. I suppose for some pubs, the way they're looking at it, it's, it's less expense, isn't it? But 
you know. You just, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's probably less expense, but e even more than that, you know, people like to see and hear things that are, with which they're familiar. It's, it's, you know, it keeps you in your comfort zone. DJs play songs people love. Um, it's also, and um, this is something that some people may not think of, DJs are, DJs are, uh, the DJ environment is great for people picking each other up. Much better, <laughs> much better than live music. That's because uh, they know, can hear themselves over the drummer. They can hear it right. And, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, they, you know, they, they all drop ecstasy or whatever they do. And, you know, they, they get into it and then they go home with each other. Um, so yeah, people like going to, to to clubs to hear to hear records. Definitely. Yeah, but we prefer live music, though. Bring it on. <laughs> I, I certainly do. Talking yeah. about records, though, David. I know off off air, basically, you mentioned that you've got a little vinyl room. Would you be able to take us to that? Well, the Is record room? room. Yeah, I mean, I'll show you what. This is my office that we're in now, and what what we're looking at here is. Uh, my my big CD box sets wow. and, and LP box sets actually. Um, back wow. here is 2019 through 2021 releases, as well as some memorabilia that's hanging up up there on the. Uh, somebody actually made an IPO. That that design um, is was on the cover of the IPO Boston program. And also uh, the cover of IPO Volume 12 CD. And somebody actually made a drum head for me for that, which I thought was very cool. But yeah, so that's this is my office. And now we'll go into the record room. So yeah, uh, I guess uh, I'm in the way here. But here's uh, a CD shelf with some smaller box sets. There's some vinyl. Wow. Um, there's wow. some, you know, a whole bunch more CDs all over the room. Um, there's, uh, this is this is very cool. If I can even get it in the frame, um, yeah, this is a, this is a mock-up of the Capitol Records building. Oh, that's awesome. That, oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it, it's made. Uh, yeah, it's it's um, about I don't know about six feet tall and. Yeah, and it, it also holds CDs. I don't know if I can get a yeah. See, there are a couple of CDs in it. So yeah, it's um, this local this local record shop had it. They yeah. didn't know what to do with it, so they gave it to me. Okay, are you sure that's not that's the real that. tower, David? You're, you're just not that tall, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God. So to, obviously, we were talking about a lot of great venues there. Obviously, and I know you mentioned like there's a lot that have shut down, etc. But obviously, you, you've you've played in some phenomenal venues like i think it was kenny was it kenny castaways in new york and the troubadour and places like that you've done some you know the cavern like some amazing venues when you're trying to book those venues like obviously i know you said earlier in terms of like um like the first ones in la and things like that obviously a lot of it's word of mouth a lot of it is through the fanzine and that, those kind of things and as you went to chicago or well, sorry new york um, and you had some friends that helped sort of book things how did you even go about picking bands in those cities? Because, like, you know, even even like obviously, they're all well known for completely different genres of music as well. You know, you've got the Chicago blues thing, you've got the whole LA, you know, the whole LA like grassroots rock and hard rock and all that. So, how how did you even go about picking bands in those cities? Like, you know, and obviously, especially for the first time that you're going to put on a festival there, what, what goes into you know to your mind when you're thinking, right, we're going to do this, we want to make it a success. You know, how, how, how do you get the right bands, you know, in the right cities with, with all the sort of cultural things that they've got there within the music? You know, how do you build that up? Well, I, I don't really factor in the, the particular cultural things. I'm looking for a, a certain genre of music. I'm looking mm -hmm. for pop music, melodic rock and roll. So even if a city is known for something different, um, as long as there's enough of those melodic rock acts in that city, then you know it's my goal to find them. Now, over the years, things have definitely changed. Um, when I started IPO back in the late '90s, uh, a lot of bands didn't even have websites, let alone any way to have you hear their music unless they sent you a CD. Uh, it wasn't online or anything at that point. Um, so I got a lot of cold submissions when bands found out about the festival, which was through word of mouth and other things. 
I would get CDs in the mail constantly uh, from bands who wanted to play. And so we found out a lot about a lot of our bands there. The, uh, another way at that time was bands who I already knew, like I said, through my, my writing reviews, they would recommend other bands. I remember we had a few in New York and Chicago who, who, who gave me a list of maybe 10 or 15 local bands that I should check out. Um, and uh, sometimes I couldn't hear their music, but I trusted these bands who I already knew that if they thought that the bands they recommended would be a good fit, then um, in many cases, I just accepted that. Other times I would ask them to please send me a CD, whatever it was, those are the ways I found out about it then. Um, obviously in the 2000s, we started having social media spring up. The first major platform then being MySpace. And around 2005, I, I was told by a friend how to do a search for bands all around the world. Um, the first few years in Liverpool, we, you know, we found out about most of our bands through the old fashioned way, recommendations and um, cold submissions. But then we, we, we were told how to search for bands from particular countries, particular cities and their genre. So MySpace had a very, very, very efficient search engine at that time. So my wife, Rena, um, who has way more patience than I do, but who knows my particular musical taste very, very well, she did a lot of the searching. She would go through, weed out, you know, separate the wheat from the chaff, um, make a list of bands whose music I should listen to, because at that point on MySpace, people had platforms where, you, you know, you could either hear the music there or you could be directed to their websites, which at that point, there was the bandwidth to have music uh, uh, up. Um, so she would, I, she would basically give me bands to audition and I would decide which ones I wanted based upon that. But MySpace was a huge help. In 2006, IPO Liverpool really started to flourish because now we started to have more and more bands from all over the world who we knew were going to be really good. And um, so MySpace was a godsend at that point. And then, you know, as time went by, you know, now we have Facebook and, and other, you know, uh, that are, that's replaced MySpace, Bandcamp, Spotify, all kinds of things. Um, so basically these days, we found most of our bands from doing our own searching. We still get cold submissions. Mm. But here, here's the interesting thing. Bands used to be way more proactive. If they wanted to play an event, they would, they would contact the, the event organizer. They would send their music. They would really be assertive in trying to get in. Now, because of all the ways that bands can represent themselves, their music on, online, they kind of figure, well, pe you know, people will find us. Um, yes and no. I mean, there have been, a, you know, we do, we do much more exhaustive searching than most, most events do. Um, it's still, I think, incumbent upon bands that if they want to play an event, they shouldn't wait to be discovered. They need to contact the organizers themselves. Uh, with IPO, as I said, we really want as much good music as we can have. So we do, we do exhaustive searching. But even then, even with that, you know, we're still probably missing out on bands who, if, if they contacted us directly, we would then know about and invite to the festival. So this is just, this is just kind of a general word out for bands. Don't, don't think that because your music is on Spotify, on Bandcamp, on Facebook, on all these different platforms, that people, people who organize events are, are going to find you. Um, there's a million other bands who, who have the same thing. So how do you, you know, how do you go through the morass of bands? I mean, like I said, uh, we do. Most events don't. So, um, and even us, you know, if you're listening to this and you want to play international pop overthrow, please don't wait for us to discover you. Contact us. Uh, I re we're very, I'm, I'm always very quick to respond. I always try to be as nice as I can. If your music doesn't fit with what we're doing and I have to turn it down, I do it in the nicest possible way. Um, 
So don't, you know, a lot of bands also fear, you know, they don't want to contact organizers because what if we get turned down? It's going to devastate us. Um, and, and granted, a lot of organizers are, they'll, they'll dismiss bands. They'll, they'll just toss them off, say, or they won't respond at all if they're not interested. I'm just not that way. I respond to everybody. Uh, I figure I always have believed in the, in, in, in the uh, credo that, do, you know, do unto others as you'd like them to do unto you. I, I don't want to be ignored. Uh, so I don't want to ignore people either. So it's a, it's a lovely means, way to be. But but all but always if you're if you're in a band and you want to play any event or you want to play any venue for that matter, contact them. Don't wait for them to contact you. Doesn't happen that often. I think that's sound advice, David. Because you know the good thing about this podcast, yes, we are a band and we talk about us, but we're here to sort of help other musicians as well and, and get people like yourself up to give advice. Like you've just done fantastically well, then. Uh, and you're right. You know, I think there's a lot of people that. You know, doesn't, you know, whether you're a covers band, originals band, you know, they, they, you do, there's a kind of counterbalance now. Yes, we do live in a great world where you've got social media, you've got YouTube. It's, it's great for bands. It's, it's a perfect world for people to make a, a name for themselves. But there's also a little element of complacency now. People aren't as hungry as they used to be. And sometimes people think just because we write good music and just because we record great stuff, that's all we need to do. Well, no, you've still got to put in the graft and the hard work. And mm-hmm. you've just nailed it on the head. So great advice for bands. You know, you've got to go out and, and give it your all. But it's funny that you said that with MySpace, because obviously with us, the Peppermint Apes, when we first played your festival, um, because I think the very first one we played before we went to America was Liverpool. Uh, we, we came, obviously, into the, I think it was 2009. That's when we played. Yeah, because we hadn't started London at that point. Yeah. Yes, because we, we formed end of 2008. And um, my dad, Colin Stanton, who's the manager of the band, and he was more involved then. He's still, he's still management now. But uh, he contacted you, I believe, through MySpace. I think that's, that's probably true, yeah. I think that's how you discovered our music. And I think one of the things, obviously, you've had you've been talking to so many bands over the years, but I think one of the comments that you said to my dad that you liked about us is the fact that we had that retro 60s sound. Because um, I think you're, you're well, look, look at the collection behind you. You're a Beatles fan and love all that kind of music. So, oh, sure. And that's what we are. We, we love that. You know, obviously, late, in recent years, we've, we've adapted a bit more of a modern sound, a bit rocky in places, but we still keep that 60s you know, blend and, and Lewis was just saying it was such off, off air. We actually went to Liverpool last year on a little vacation where we, we, whilst it was safe to do so, and the cabin, the buzz, just hearing Beatles songs again, it was just great, you know, just to get back and and, and since then we've been writing songs in that vein. But going back to it, obviously we played your festival in Liverpool. Um we played, I think, because of what I loved about your festival is we played obviously the venue uh, where Paul McCartney had played. Obviously, with Dave Gilmore, etc., and, and loads of other great artists, and you also put us in the Cabin Pub because you also you include. Do you still include that in your in your IPO? Festival? Yes, we still include. We still include the ca- the Cavern Pub. Uh, That's brilliant. I love that little venue. And we, yeah, I mean, a lot of bands have told me that their favorite gig uh, because every every band plays twice, and uh, they play usually they play on one stage of the Cavern Club and the Cavern Pub. And uh, some bands have told me their their favorite gig was the one at the pub because mm. it's so much more intimate and the, the crowd is on top of you almost. So if they like you, you really feel it. Yeah, um, it, it's a it's a really nice space, and yeah, we're very happy to be still using it. Absolutely, and it's I just loved it. It's been Beatles fans. It was a great privilege to have played there. I think we played the IPA festival twice at Liverpool for you, but uh, also we obviously came to America. Uh, played Kenny Castaways, didn't we? Um, New York, and we played. Um, we came to London as well uh, and played your festival. So we would love to come back and, and do something next year. This year we're pretty fully booked and getting back to the the norm, if you like. But we'd love to maybe play Cavern if you're doing it every year and, and whatnot. So it's a we sure hope to to continue pleasure. to do it. And you're you're. I will certainly make a note to invite you. You you're back absolutely. Don't wait for him, Ryan. Chase him down. Tell him you want to play. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be proactive. Exactly. I'm going to take yeah. David's advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, 
Quick question though, David, you mentioned about the bands and, and how you kind of, you, you filtered through and, and listened and, and, and came to sort of who you wanted to pick over the years. What about venues? How did you sort of approach venues like the Cavern um, and get them on the radar? How did you come across that? It must have been really hard to get a foot in the door with those kind of venues. It, it always is. I mean, as I mentioned, the Cavern came, you know, indirectly came to me through uh, Gene Cathero. I don't think I would have approached them on my own. I would have just figured there's no way they would have us. And tr truthfully, they wouldn't have if it wasn't for Jean. It's only because uh, the owners of the cavern trusted her word. She told them, you really should do this. I have a very good feeling about David. I have a very good feeling about this event. Um, and they, um, they took her at her word. I think if I had come to them cold, they would, there would have been no chance for them. They were, I mean, they had to give up a week uh, at that point um, of, of, you know, of dates for something they'd never heard of. That's, uh, you know, this is a cavern club we're talking about. For them to do that, they, they have to be assured. Um, so I would, I don't even think I would have approached them, but other venues, it's always hard. Um, what you hope for is that whoever's booking that venue has heard about the festival. That's happened. Um, many of the booking people over the years have actually had bands themselves who've played IPO. So if I contact, I've had that happen without even knowing it. I'll contact a venue and I find out that the person who's booking it, oh yeah, we played IPO at such and such venue a couple of years ago. So yeah, we know, we know how good it is and we'll have you. Um, that happens. Um, Sometimes I'll need, you know, a referral from a band who, you know, who's, who the booking person knows really well, you know, kind of like what Gene Catherell did uh, for, at the Cavern, only this time it's a band member who says, yes, we played IPO, it draws well, the music is really good, you should do it. Um, so that helps in, in a lot of cases. And sometimes I do contact them cold, and sometimes... If, and I try to present IPO in the most favorable light. I give I give as many referrals as I can. I uh, references. I mean, I um, yeah. I just I tell them about, about our history and how long we've been doing it, where we've played, and you know, sometimes they're very very interested. Other times they're not. Um, it's um, you know, it's a roll of the dice in a lot of cases. Well, so, I'm so glad you, know, you have done it over the years because you know, I'm so glad we're here today talking to you because it's just like I say, it's an it's an amazing event and the, the venues thank you. you managed to get thank you, Ryan. Are iconic but venues. So we have you know, we have been in several. You mentioned the Troubadour. Um, another big one in LA is the El Rey. That's a pretty iconic venue. We were in a, a, a few years ago. Well, more like back in the beginning years. Um, Kenny's Castaways was a, a pretty iconic venue. Um, there, are, there are a few others. Maxwell's in New Jersey. Uh, unfortunately, both Kenny's Castaways and Maxwell's uh, have been closed for several years. Well, let's put it, Maxwell's reopened, but not in the same way. It's not cool anymore. It's much more corporate. Um, so it, it doesn't have the same vibe. No. Um, in Los Angeles, we were also in the Derby. I don't know if you've ever seen the, mu the movie Swingers, but um, it was about the swing scene in the 90s. And a lot of the scenes were done in the Derby. And it had a lot, it, it had a, that venue had a real aura of cool about it. So when they, ex when, when they had us, it, it, it was just a big thrill to be part of that. So yeah, uh, over the years we've been in some, you know, very not uh, very awesome venues. Nothing will touch the cavern. No. But but, but we've been in some we've been in some other really good ones, um really well-known ones in in different cities. But again, you know, it it depends on who's booking uh, uh, the venue, it depends on, you know, maybe what time of year you're you're going for. The summer is usually easier to get than the winter. Um, you know, cause during the summer, people like to go outside more than they like to go into clubs. Um, you know, so uh, there's so many factors, many, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm constantly surprised both, you know, pleasantly and unpleasantly, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, a, it's, it's going to be a bigger challenge with, you know, as COVID 
Stronger. Even as COVID starts to ease into more of a you know normality, it's still going to be the new normal. And the new normal means there are going to be fewer venues and um, venues who are more reluctant to take a chance on something they don't know because they're more, more and more concerned with being able to survive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you're in survival mode, you, you take things that you know are going to, you know, draw people in and make you money. You're less likely to take things where you have to take a chance on it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm going to, we have a lot of history behind us. We have played at some really cool venues. I have a lot of, thankfully, I have a lot of friends who are musicians that do um, recommend us to different venues. Um, so I think we're going to be okay. It's just going to take a little more work and maybe a little more time. I mean, this year, we may not do as many IPOs as, as we've done in the past. We probably won't. But, you know, within a year or two, we should be back up to speed. Yeah, one step at a time. Um, yeah. As long may it continue. Um, Final Thank question, you. though, David, and, you know, thanks again for coming on this podcast. Um, but tell us a bit about your podcast that you host. Yes, um, I host a podcast called Material Issues. Again, uh, sort of named after the band Material Issue, who I just who I, um, mentioned earlier. I named the, the festival after their debut album. Um, my, my, uh, my good friend and podcast partner, Mark Birchberger, came to me... Uh, a few months ago with the idea for us to do this podcast. But at the time, it was just going to be us every week talking about you know, new music, old music, different, you know, cultural things that were happening, whatever. It would have been, it was going to be completely free form. And in fact, the first two episodes were exactly like that. It was just us talking about what we wanted. We got very, very silly. So it was a lot of fun. But then... I, I said, you know, Mark, we've got, I've got lots of friends who are musicians. You have some friends who are musicians. We should, we should have musicians be our guests. I think people would be very interested in that. So he said, yeah, I agree. And so since episode two, we're now, we just finished episode 38. Almost every one of them have had guests, mostly musicians, uh, new, new and old. Um, we've had a lot of UK musicians, actually, uh, from from the 70s and 80s be our guests. In fact, next week, we're going to have Gilbert O'Sullivan, who wow. had the, yeah, who had all those huge hits in the 70s, both in the States and in the UK. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, he's got, uh, he's, he's, he's going back out on tour and he wants to promote the tour. So he agreed to come on with us. Uh, people, a lot of people, what people don't realize about him is he's still writing and recording and his stuff is really almost as good as, as what he was doing in, in the seventies. And he's still in very good voice. The only difference is the radio doesn't play songs like that now. Um, you know, he, he's not writing hip hop. No, um, <laughs> you know, he's not right. He's not writing three chord tune, you know, songs drenched in auto tune. Um, so, so radio is not necessarily interested in that, but he's still very viable. And fortunately he still has a core crowd of, of people who've been fans of his for years. So I think his shows are going to do fine. Um, so yeah, we have those kind of guests and we've also had a few guests that are outside of that realm. Occasionally we want to get out of our comfort zone. We had uh, a woman named Sharon Gabbett a few weeks ago who was a star of the U.S. soap opera, The Edge of Night. Uh, she was on it in the 70s and 80s. And so we had her on. We had an author named uh, Albert um, Alan Jacobson a few weeks ago. He writes thriller, FBI kind of books, crime books. So we had him on. So occasionally we want to branch out from music, but it's mostly been music guests. And uh, we've had a really wonderful time doing it. Brilliant. So how do Unbelievable. People, is, it, is it all year only or do you, do you put out a video as well? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's like uh, the Peppermint Apes uh, podcast. It's uh, oh, audio and video. Um, we use a, a platform called StreamYard because yeah. it's able to go live to uh, Facebook and YouTube. So we, we use that. Uh, you need a little bit more bandwidth to use it. Like... I'm using my iPad for Zoom. It works just fine. 
when I try to use the iPad for StreamYard, it freezes up. I have an older iPad, so I don't have it. it it's it, the platform just is too it's too modern for the iPad. But um, but it uh, it's it's been fine, and you know most of our guests have not had too many technical issues. Uh, they either use iPhones or computers that have cameras and microphones, and it seems to work out fine. Um, but it's um, it's audio and video goes out live. Um, it's mo mostly we do the shows at uh, three o'clock Pacific time, which is eleven a.m. p.m. GMT. So a lot of our UK listeners have already gone to bed, unfortunately. But as it turns out, for Gilbert O'Sullivan, we're moving the show three hours earlier next week. Oh, no, I've got to eleven p.m. Eleven p.m. is past his bedtime, so. Um, We'll uh, we'll be doing it at eight PM GMT next week. Oh, fantastic! This gives you three hours to talk, doesn't it? Gives you a lot longer. <laughs> yeah. So, for people that want to check out the IPO festival, for bands that want to get in contact, for people that also want to, you know, check out your podcast, how do people check everything out? What other website links, etc., David? Yes. Well, um, uh, the our website is internationalpopoverthrow.com. Uh, if you go there, you'll pretty much see everything about us, including um, the shows we've done in the past and the ones that are coming up. They'll have the pages will have artist links to artist music pages, mostly Facebook, but sometimes Bandcamp or or whatever. Facebook, we 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 think it, it, it's a fairly neutral platform, and most bands have their Bandcamp link on it. So if you start on Facebook you can usually get to their music anyway. Um, so go to internationalpopoverthrow.com. You can also find our Facebook page through that. Um, material issues, we have, uh, if, you, if you're on Facebook, just type in material issues. You'll, you'll find our page. You can join it and you'll get uh, notifications about our shows. Um, also, it's, it's, if you go to YouTube, and type in material issues, you'll get our YouTube page as well. All of our past shows are archived, by the way. So if you, you know, if you didn't, if you haven't seen them, you can go to uh, our Facebook or YouTube page and see them there. If you, you know, if, if you miss one, um, it'll be archived as soon as it's over. Um, so let's say, you're, you know, you, um, let's say you live in New York and you're not home from work at, at, at 6 p.m. New York time. Um, if you're home at 7 p.m., you'll notice the show is just finished and it's archived already. So you can, you can go to it. either of those pages and watch it there. We, we, we like having people live because they, they leave comments as the show's happening. And, uh, more interactive, it, I suppose, isn't it? It's more interactive, yes. At some point, I so, think we're gonna adapt to that. <laughs> yeah, That's hopefully cool. so. But um, so, we, yeah, we have a, we have a, we've really had a good time doing it. So it's every Wednesday, three o'clock Pacific time, six six o'clock Eastern time, and eleven o'clock GMT. So, yeah, hopefully, um, hopefully more people join. We, I'm you know, sure they will, it. and I recommend everyone check it out and obviously get in contact with David if you're a band, and obviously keep an eye out for the IPO festival. David, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. And it's been uh, my pleasure as well, Ryan and Lewis. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. No, it's been brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And obviously, sorry, David, as well. Just th th what's the next dates coming up for anyone? You know, if we've got any people that are listening in the States or in the UK, and obviously you mentioned the cavern is in the UK in May. What's your next ones coming up sort of in, you know, prior to May? Have you got any dates lined up in the States prior to then? Or? Yes, we do. Um, we have Phoenix, Arizona. That's, that's the short one. It's only one day. Um, but it goes it goes from the afternoon into late night. That's April second at a venue, a very cool venue called Cactus Jacks. So um, we've done we've done the festival there several times. We're looking forward to it. Then Chicago, um, we that's a long one. That's uh, April twenty uh, second through thirtieth. So it's nine days. Uh, there's a lot of pop bands in Chicago, so um, it. Uh, we're able to do nine days there. It's at a really cool venue called Montrose Saloon. Um, I have not been to it yet, but I've seen pictures and every band I speak with says it's a great, great place. And uh, see, this is another thing. The guy who owns the club 
had bands who had played IPO before. So he was very happy to have us for every night uh, of the festival. Uh, that was a really, that was very, a big break for us. So we're, um, you know, we're, so we're looking forward to that. And then of course, Liverpool, um, we will be in Vancouver, uh, Canada at, uh, wow. from, let me see if I remember the dates, August 31st through September 3rd. And my birthday is September 2nd. So I'm kind of used to having my birthday up in Vancouver. And it's such a beautiful place with a great music scene that I always look forward to celebrating my birthday there. Oh, that's so those are the ones that are set up at the moment. I'm, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm working on Los Angeles. Maybe we'll end up doing Portland, Oregon. And hopefully in November, we'll do um, New York, Boston, and Hamilton, Ontario, Canada again. So, you know, everything remains to be seen, but I'm very optimistic. Yes. I think uh, I think things in the um, pandemic world are going to continue to ease up and uh, everything should be good to go. Fantastic. Fantastic. We look forward to, you know, seeing more posts about the IPO and, and playing at your festival again in the future. So mm -hmm. uh, Hopefully we'll be able to come up to Liverpool and see you again. We would love, uh, both Rena and I would love that. We we certainly, we've always loved you guys. We, you know, I remember your shows very well, both, you know, in New York, in Liverpool and in London. Um, so, um, oh, and that's another thing. Um, uh, after we did London for the four years that we did it from um, 2011 through 14, we, uh, we then moved over to Stockholm and uh, we did IPO there from 2015 through 19. Mm -hmm. Then the pandemic wow. hit, but sweet Stockholm has been hit very hard by the pandemic. Um, and um, we're having a lot of trouble booking uh, IPO there. So that may not happen this year, but even if, if it doesn't, it'll happen again next year. Stockholm is probably my favorite city, actually. It's beautiful. I don't know if you've been, but if you I've haven't, never, you should. never been there before, but I would, um, it's on the to-do list. There's so many places it, it, I want to go to. It's, yeah, it's, I just it's want to travel around the IPO festival now. Just go to every different place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had an artist. Um, we had an artist called Dave Rave. You may remember him from playing IPO. I don't know if he played when you when you did, but in 2010, he sent me an email and he said, "David, I want to play every IPO you do until until I can't do it anymore." And I, I thought he was just kidding me. But as it turns out, he ended up playing 50 IPOs in a row. He followed us everywhere for four years wow. until finally, you know, things got in the way. And he, now he does them every now and then. But back then, 50 in a row. That's a record I'm sure will never be What's broken. What's a legend? Everyone check yeah. out Dave Rave. <laughs> he really, he really, I could not believe it. Every, I don't care what city it was or where it was, he came to them all. Um, so yeah, uh, Stockholm would be a great place for you guys to play. And not only is it a beautiful city, but I mean, you walk down any street in Stockholm, you're gonna you're going to find a record store. Yeah. I've never seen more record shops in, in in a city than I have in Stockholm, and so many of them are really good. I can't tell you uh, how many records, amazing records I, and CDs I found in Stockholm. Nice. Uh, so that's another reason I love going there every year. There's just so many good reasons to travel, but uh, but no, David, thank you very much again, and uh, we will, we will check out your podcast every Wednesday. Yes, please do, and uh, we look forward to seeing you um, in in person whenever that can happen. Absolutely, that would be great. All the best, David. It's a pleasure talking to you again, a and you. I'm